Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me start, as I always do, by updating you on the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,655 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 61 from yesterday. A total of 1,447 patients are in hospital. At 969 of those have been confirmed as having the virus and 478 are suspected of having it. That represents a total increase in the number of people in hospital of 20 from yesterday. But within that, it is a decrease of 36 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 59 people last night were in intensive care uh, with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is a decrease of four since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm that since the 5th of March, a total now of 3,408 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised uh, have been able to leave hospital. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report in the past 24 hours, 29 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. And that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,134. Tomorrow, we will have the latest publication from National Records of Scotland, uh, which include not just uh, people who have died having tested positive, but all uh, those deaths where COVID-19 has been mentioned on a death certificate. And as always at this stage, I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost and is grieving for a loved one as a result of this virus. I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. The whole of the country continues to be very grateful to you for the extraordinary work that you are doing in these very challenging circumstances. I have two items I want to briefly update on today. Uh, the first relates to the publication this morning of the latest employment figures in Scotland. Uh, these are for the period January to March of this year. And as such, these are the first figures that include any of the period of the COVID-19 crisis. They show that 113,000 people in Scotland are now unemployed. That is up from just under 100,000 in the previous three months. That is an unemployment rate of 4.1%. Now, by historical standards, that actually is still a relatively low rate. But of course, it's important to stress that these figures, since they only extend up to the end of March, do not reflect the full economic impact of the pandemic. And they undoubtedly further demonstrate the need to carefully get our economy moving again as quickly as we're able to do that safely. And they underline the continuing need for government action to support the economy and to help people keep their jobs or to enter or re-enter the workforce. We know that the essential public health measures that we've had to take to deal with what is a public health emergency are in themselves creating an economic emergency. And that will have impact on people's jobs, living standards and inequalities in our society. And although the job retention scheme has offered some relief to many employers and employees, I'm very aware that many people will be right now deeply concerned about the future of their livelihoods. That's why we've already allocated more than £2.3 billion to support businesses and protect livelihoods. And of course, it's why we have welcomed so warmly many of the measures taken by the UK government, including the job retention scheme. In addition, Skills Development Scotland, as I discussed last week, has expanded its support for people seeking training or employment by establishing a phone line and online service. The new online service, which highlights links to free courses which are available, has received 120,000 visits since it launched just over three weeks ago. Uh, today, we're taking further action to tackle the employment challenge uh, created by COVID. Our Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board, which was first established around two and a half years ago, will now coordinate rapid action across our enterprise and skills agencies. In doing so, it will ensure that our actions uh, now are helping to equip people with the skills they need for the future. It will report back to us in June on what additional measures we need to take. However, I can confirm today that we will be investing a further £33 million to support people back to work as we gradually get the economy opened up again. 
This initial funding, uh, most of which will be allocated to Fair Start Scotland, which is our devolved employability service, will have a particular focus on helping those most adversely affected in times of economic downturn, which are young people, disabled people and lone parents. Today's announcement is one further action amongst many in our efforts to tackle the economic impacts of this crisis, but it is, I think, an important one. We know all too well from previous recessions that the longer people stay jobless, the greater the chance of further impacts. Their skills can deteriorate, their confidence can fall, and that in turn can have an impact on future prospects. We also know that these effects are, of course, bad for individuals, especially young people and that they are also damaging for the economy as a whole. And that means when an upturn comes, when the economy starts to recover, employers can find it more difficult to hire the people that they need. So for all of these reasons, we are determined to do everything we can to protect Scotland's workforce, to minimise as far as we can the increase in unemployment, but also to ensure that we are ready for a sustainable recovery. And today's actions represent a further step in helping us to do that. The second issue I want to touch on briefly relates uh, to the fact, as was mentioned yesterday, that this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, this year's theme is kindness. In many ways, that's especially appropriate right now. Uh, kindness should, I think, be one of the core values of any good society. But as I suspect most of us have experienced in recent weeks, even small acts of kindness can make a huge difference to the way someone is feeling. Uh, we have been aware throughout this crisis of the impact that COVID and our lockdown measures are likely to have on people's mental health. Uh, that's why we've expanded NHS 24's telephone and online services to support mental health. It's why we established a national wellbeing hub to support the mental health of NHS and social care staff. And it's also why we launched the Clear Your Head campaign, which you may have seen in the media. Clear Your Head provides practical advice on how to stay active, keep connected with friends and family and create healthy routines to help get through this crisis. Uh, and today we're making a further investment to support the mental health and well-being of parents and carers in particular. Solihull Online is a programme that helps parents and carers to learn uh, about uh, what their child may be going through and to develop nurturing and supportive relationships. Uh, and from today, all parents and carers in Scotland will have access to the programme. And if you are interested in this, you can find more information by going to parentclub.scot. Final point I want to make is that one of the most important things to remember during Mental Health Awareness Week for all of us is that it is OK sometimes not to feel OK. And that when that is the case, help is there and available if you need it. Uh, you can speak to someone if you need to, and I would encourage you to do so. The Clear Your Head website, clearyourhead.scot, brings together our information about the support that is available for mental health. So please have a look at the website during this Awareness Week, and please continue uh, as far as all of us can to show kindness to each other as we try to get through this crisis together. Now, before I hand over briefly to the Chief Medical Officer, I want to emphasise once again our key public health measures. As I said yesterday, on Thursday this week, we will publish a route map setting out how, on a phased basis, we will ease the lockdown while continuing to suppress the virus. And my hope and intention is that we will take the first concrete steps on that journey next week. But we will increase both the likelihood and the extent of that by sticking to the rules now. Uh, please stay at home except for essential purposes such as daily exercise, going to essential work that you can't do from home or buying essential items. Uh, you can, of course, exercise now more than once a day, but when you do leave home, stay more than two metres away from others and don't meet up with people from other households. Please think about wearing a face covering if you are in a shop or on public transport and remember to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And finally, if you or someone else in your household has symptoms of the virus, then you should stay at home completely. And let me remind you, those symptoms are a high temperature, a persistent cough, or now a change or loss of smell or taste. For now, these restrictions do remain essential. They are helping us to slow down the spread of the virus. They are helping us to protect the NHS and they are helping us to save lives. So thank you once again to everyone for your cooperation. Let me hand over now to the Chief Medical Officer uh, before we move to questions.
Thank you, First Minister. So as the First Minister has already mentioned, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. And this year's theme is kindness, which I think is especially appropriate because our progress in tackling this virus has been marked by remarkable acts of kindness all across our country. So I want to firstly take this opportunity to say thank you to my NHS and social care colleagues. We are all deeply grateful for your kindness, for your hard work, commitment and professionalism at this time of unprecedented challenge. I also want to highlight some of the work that is underway to support you and your mental health at this time, so that you know you are being looked after whilst you are looking after us. It is okay not to be okay and there is help available if you need it. My ask of you is that you don't bottle this up inside, but that you find a way that you are comfortable to talk about it. We have written to NHS boards, to local authorities and to integrated authority chief officers about the importance of staff wellbeing, highlighting key messages and approaches and we've reiterated these in recent directives issued to health boards and mental health services. We've also established a workforce wellbeing champion network across health and social care organisations to ensure learning can be shared across sectors. We're providing online coaching support through a bespoke digital platform in partnership with NHS Education for Scotland, with up to 1,000 hours of coaching available to staff from across health and social care during COVID-19. They are also developing national resources, training models and systems of practice support for local delivery to promote and address staff wellbeing. And as the First Minister has mentioned, we have launched the National Wellbeing Hub, which will support all health and social care staff in Scotland. You can access that online at promise.scot. That's P-R-O-M-I-S dot Scot. That hub will provide resources for all health and social care staff and your families aimed at promoting resilience and well-being through signposting you to help and support that is available either nationally, locally or within your own organisations. It will cover the wide range of needs you might need support with and will provide information and resources for health and social care organisations to help them support you. We are also working to ensure that appropriate mental health services are available to any staff members who might require more specialist support and care over the coming months. We recognise the importance of building in this work to ensure that appropriate, practical and emotional support is available to everyone in Scotland who is providing care. Throughout this, we are rediscovering what matters most – our health, our families and our communities. I want to end by thanking you once more and emphasising once again to everyone listening today, by staying at home, you are protecting the NHS, you are helping my colleagues and doing a simple act of kindness that ultimately saves lives. Thanks very much, uh, Gregor. I should have said at the outset, the Health Secretary is uh, due to answer questions and make a statement in Parliament uh, in the early part of this afternoon, which is why she hasn't joined us for this update uh, today. Um, can I move now uh, straight to questions? First question comes from David Wallace Lockhart from BBC Scotland. Thank you, First Minister. I've spoken today with a tour guide who gave a tour to delegates who were at the night conference in February where there was an outbreak of coronavirus. He was never contacted and told he'd been in contact with people who were linked to a COVID outbreak. Every day we're hearing more and more stories like this. Do you still defend the response to that outbreak and how many people were contact traced in response? I've Let, let me address this uh, at some length. I've addressed this a couple of times already, but I do understand the concerns that have been raised about this, so I think it's really important that I do that again in, in some detail. And in doing so, I want to uh, distinguish between two issues which are not unconnected but sometimes can be conflated and they're not always one and the same thing. Uh, the first issue is the public health management of a situation like this. And the second issue is what information is put into the, the public domain. Uh, if I can deal firstly with the public health management, uh, in a situation like this, and this happened in this case, an incident management team is established. That is a, an incident management team that is comprised of very experienced public health professionals. And it is their task to investigate the incident and decide what follow-up is required 
in order to protect public health and uh, minimise the risk of onward infection. And as part of that, they will do uh, contact tracing. Uh, I don't have the figure you asked for right now. We will see if we can get you that. But I would say in this case, this was an international contact tracing exercise because there were delegates from a number of different countries. But the point I'm making is that incident management team will do everything it thinks is necessary to protect public health. And it will have uh, contacted people who fitted the definition of a contact. And had they uh, believed that there was further actions that they required to take to protect public health, they would have taken those actions uh, because they are uh, experts in uh, these matters. The second issue, uh, which I know is related, but they are not entirely the same issue, is the, the information that's put into the public domain. Now, in this case, the, the reason that more information was not put into the public domain was uh, to do with patient confidentiality. And I want to be very clear here, this is not a made up reason. It was the real reason and actually a legitimate reason when case numbers were so low and when the numbers of attendees from Scotland at this conference were also so low that to have uh, named the event would almost certainly have identified the patients. So. Patient confidentiality is a legitimate reason. That said, I think it is also legitimate, and I want to be very clear about this, for people to question whether that should have been the overriding consideration. And certainly as First Minister and uh, the government reflect on that and, and you know, listen carefully to those views. And at different stages of the kind of situation we're dealing with now with this virus, different balances of judgment will be made. For example, one of the things we are considering right now as part of our test trace isolate program is what the balance of judgment in these situations will be between patient confidentiality and information made available to the public. So these are not always fixed considerations right throughout uh, a different situation. So I hope that explains the, the different issues at stake here. And the key point I'm making is that the fact that uh, particular decision was made about public information based on patient confidentiality does not influence uh, or reduce the fact that the incident management team was dealing with it from a public health protection perspective. The last point I would make is this, and I suppose this is the point I do take exception to, the idea that there was some kind of deliberate attempt to cover up the fact that there had been uh, cases of the virus identified at this conference. Um, for that to have been true of the government, it would have to have been true of you know, non-political public health experts, and you know, that is not the case. And as I said yesterday, what possible motive would there have been to do that? So I accept that people will look at this and say, actually, we think you should have reached a different judgment. That's legitimate, and I accept that, and we reflect on that. But I hope people will understand both the reasons uh, for the decisions that were made, which were legitimate reasons at the time, even if some will disagree with them, uh, but also the strenuous efforts that are always made in these cases through the incident management uh, team uh, procedure to deal with the public health protection issues. Um, and I'm sorry for taking a bit of time on that, but I think it's important from the public's point of view uh, that those, both of those issues are understood. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. Yeah, I, I've spoken to the same tour guide as David has. Uh, he was one of three who watched the Nike delegates give what he describes as a rugby-style haka in the foyer of the hotel to energise themselves before those three tour guides then took them on a, a walking tour of the old town in groups of 20, which lasted uh, well over an hour. So that's three tour guides. There was also a party of 20 Lloyd's banking staff who shared facilities with the Nike delegates, uh, tea, coffee facilities, lunch facilities, touchscreen coffee machines. Now, uh, you talk about the interests of public health being best served. Uh, and assessments being made of uh, the de you know about the definition of a contact uh, and the interests of protecting the public health. Looking at the contact between the tour guides, the Lloyds Bank staff, and the Nike delegates, how can you possibly say that public health was best protected by saying nothing about the outbreak until it broke in the media? Again. 
These are legitimate questions, and I want to, to stress that. But again, let me just separate out the two issues, which I know overlap, but they are nevertheless uh, separate to some extent with the, the issues about public information. And I've explained the reason for that. At the time of this, uh, th these cases in Scotland being identified, there were uh, only a handful of cases in the whole of Scotland that had been confirmed at that case. And there were only 10 people, I think, from the whole of Scotland uh, who were at this conference. You would have identified people now. I accept that some people will say patient confidentiality shouldn't have been the consideration, but it's not a made up consideration. It was real and legitimate. Um, and, you know, we reflect and as we go through uh, a situation like this, those considerations may well be different. And I, I've made the point about TTI and, and the things we are developing there. But on the public health, it is for experts. We have, and Gregor might want to say a bit about how these things operate, not, not just with uh, coronavirus, but in any uh, case of infectious disease. If there are cases identified, then this incident management team uh, procedure it kicks in and these are public health experts who will decide who should be contacted, uh, what the basis for that is, what steps have to be taken to make sure that all risks of onward transmission have been dealt with. I am not a, a public health expert. Uh, these are, are decisions rightly taken and the point I'm making here is that had that incident management team uh, had it considered that there was further people that should have been contacted or further steps that should have been taken to protect public health, they would have done that and they would have been entirely free to do that because that is their responsibility. So I think it is important. I, I understand the concerns that have been expressed here. I don't want to play that down. These are important issues. But I think it is important to understand these two separate issues um, and not to... Uh, have the, the view that because, for the reasons I have set out, uh, that there wasn't a public announcement made about the Nike conference, I don't want anybody to go away with the view that that means the public health issues of this and the health protection issues around this were not properly dealt with in the normal way, uh, because they, they were. Uh, Gregor, do you want to say any more about how an incident management team will go around these things? So I think it's really important to understand the role of the incident management team in managing any identified outbreak, and whether that be COVID-19, whether that be tuberculosis, whether that be any other infectious disease that an incident management team is reformed around. The important thing is that this is a, a group of health protection professionals who come together to analyse all the available um, evidence and information that relates to the identification of the index case and the potential contacts that they may have had and how that may uh, have kind of influenced an outbreak. And it's that clinical professional judgment as to how that outbreak may have progressed and any particular steps that may be required to make sure that that outbreak is, is limited, which is is, is, is the, 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 the kind of day in, day out job, the role of these health protection experts. And, and, and they have the ability at any point in time where they feel that there needs to be a public disclosure about that particular incident. They have the ability to be able to do that. They have the powers to enable them to be able to do that. And in this case, the judgment was that that wasn't necessary, that they had the available evidence, they tracked, they traced, and they followed the routes that they judged, and this is really important, where the basis of the clinical risk to individuals lay. Great, thank you. Uh, Ewan Petrie from STV. Thank you very much, First Minister. I wonder if you could give us your reaction to the joint letter from union leaders, care home chiefs and nurses, saying there is insufficient cooperation between the UK and Scottish government. Is a lack of cooperation harming efforts to increase testing? And will you consider expanding testing to all residents and care homes now? The Health Secretary will be making a statement in Parliament shortly about care homes uh, and the actions we're taking in care homes, and that will include uh, what she set out yesterday around the expansion of testing. She set out yesterday, and she'll do more today, the reasons, and these are clinically driven decisions about why the decision has been made uh, to test uh, staff in care homes where there's no uh, cases of the infection and not at this stage residents, because it is, uh, and this is, I should say, through no fault of their own, the risk is that staff may, if they have been infected, uh, take that infection into uh, care homes. Uh, there are also issues around uh, the invasive nature of this test and whether it would be appropriate to do it at all. Um, 
for all residents, regardless of whether they have symptoms and regardless of whether there is an outbreak in a, a care home. But these, these things, it is really important, are clinically uh, led. You would also, and, and the intention is with staff, it will be done regularly, so it's not a one-off test. Uh, and uh, there would be, uh, I am advised, not very much uh, clinical benefit in doing simply a one-off test of, of residents, which I understand, although I stand to be corrected here, is what the proposal in, in England is. On the issue of cooperation, I, I've, not, I've not seen that letter, my apologies, um, but it, there is good cooperation between the different nations of the UK. Uh, we are, uh, for good reasons, given the, the state uh, and the stage of the, the virus spread in our different areas of responsibility, coming to uh, slightly different decisions. Uh, you know, Northern Ireland has uh, taken steps to ease lockdown that haven't yet been taken in England or, or Wales or Scotland. England has taken some steps that aren't yet taken in Scotland or, or Wales. So these are, are, are decisions we are coming to about the phasing and the speed at which we are moving. And they are all driven by the desire, which I believe is a strong collective desire, to do everything we possibly can uh, to suppress this virus as quickly as we possibly can. On uh, testing, there is very good cooperation on testing. If you uh, look at the, there are two testing strands in Scotland. There is the uh, more substantial uh, one in terms of the capacity uh, that operates through the NHS, uh, and that's where health and care workers would get tested, and those tests are processed within NHS labs. And as I've covered before, we've gone from having two of these to having one now in every health board area. And then there's the strand of testing that is the drive-through centres at airports, the, the mobile testing units uh, that then go to be processed at the Lighthouse Laboratory at Glasgow University, and that is part of the UK-wide scheme. And it is through that strand, of course, that we announced the extension yesterday to anybody with symptoms over five. So there is good cooperation. I think with all of these things, we want to have as much cooperation as possible. But it is simply a statement of fact that on many of these things, they are devolved responsibilities. And then it, and therefore, it is uh, not just necessary. I think it's appropriate for me to recognise my direct accountability on making sure that these things uh, happen as everybody would expect them to happen. Uh, Kieran Jenkins from Channel 4. First Minister, a lot of key data about hospital discharges to care homes is not published. In the interests of transparency, can you ensure that we have answers, please, to how many patients were discharged from hospitals to care homes in March and April without tests or with positive tests? And also, how many hospital discharge care home beds the Scottish Government, one, approved and two, agreed to finance in relation to COVID-19. And then a question for you to answer now. Was it a mistake to encourage hospitals to discharge patients to care homes before you'd introduced proper testing? Um, so let me uh, answer as much of that as I can right now. On the question of more data, we, which I, I hope you will accept, are trying to publish as much data as we can and we will try to increase the amount and the granularity of the data we publish on an ongoing basis. So uh, I will certainly discuss with uh, Health Protection Scotland and with National Records of Scotland what we can add to the data we publish. The data we publish already, particularly on numbers of deaths, is certainly more up to date than in other parts of the UK, but we want to make sure the detail of that is as comprehensive as, as possible. And that's an assurance I have given uh, all along. On the issue of delayed discharge, uh, the Scottish Government, and you know, again, I, uh, you know, this was something that uh, was important at the time and was uh, considered to be important for good reasons. We had to, uh, because we knew what the implications would be uh, of not doing this, we had to make sure our health service had the capacity to deal with what could have been a much, much more significant surge in demand for hospital services. And a range of things were done, including reducing delayed discharge. And I would, I would just remind people that getting delayed discharges down is something that we work to do. And it's a good thing to do at all times, not just in a time of crisis. Crisis. People should not be delayed in hospital any longer uh, than is necessary for them. So uh, getting delayed discharge down is not inappropriately getting people out of hospital. Delayed discharges are people who shouldn't be in hospital uh, in the first place. And I think that's an important uh, piece of context. So there was, uh, including with Scottish Government resources, uh, a, a real effort to do that. We will uh, certainly look at what uh, further numbers and data we can give you around this. But I uh, think as the, the Health Secretary perhaps uh, covered at a briefing much earlier on, 
in uh, the management of this crisis. The majority of people who were uh, discharged from hospital as part of that uh, reduction in delayed discharge uh, were discharged to their own homes uh, and not to, to care homes. Uh, so that, that was always uh, one of the, the key priorities. So, you know, that was the reasons why we did these things. Again, delayed discharge is something we should uh, try to reduce at all times. Um, and these decisions should be based on what is clinically appropriate for the individual. But we will uh, seek uh, as soon as we can and with as much detail as we can to get you as much additional data as possible. Please just to address that particular question. It wasn't about delayed discharge in general. It was specifically to ask you if it was a mistake to discharge patients from hospitals to care homes before proper testing. Uh, the, the point I made, and I think I, I did address this, is that decisions on delayed discharge and, and where a person is discharged to should be based on what is best for uh, the individual concerned uh, rather than... Uh, you know, based on the pursuit of a particular policy. Gregor, do you want to add to that? So I think we need to be really careful here that what you seem to be suggesting is the assumption that, that um, a test gives you the all clear uh, at any point in time. And remember, a, a test only tells you at that point in time whether a patient will test positive and, and ha has um, shedding virus at that point in time. What's more important is the safeguards that are put in place around about making sure that that person uh, receives um, adequate and appropriate infection prevention control measures to make sure that um, even if they are incubating signs of COVID-19, and this is regardless of whether they're in a care home, in a hospital bed or going home, is that they're given the proper advice to make sure that if they're incubating uh, COVID-19 is that they are isolated in a way to make sure that they don't spread that disease um, beyond um, themselves. Those measures were in place for care homes from a very early point in time and regardless of whether patients were tested or not, it's that which makes the biggest impact in terms of making sure that infection doesn't spread. OK, thank you. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, you have seen the uh, news today that the OVO Energy Supply Company uh, is threatening uh, redundancies, including uh, possibly up to 400 in Selkirk, which would be a a massive blow uh, for a place like that. Is there anything uh, your government can do to try and stop that? And on a related issue, we were looking today at the effect of the COVID crisis on poverty. We know people who are poorest suffer the most. The IPPR think tank has suggested that you could pay a lump sum of 250 pounds per child to low income families this summer and that, they say, would be relatively simple and make a massive difference. I wonder if you can promise to do that. Um, on that point, I'm not going to make promises uh, before I've properly considered the, the deliverability of, of those promises. And, and I, you know, I, I don't like having to say this because I would, there's lots I would really like to do right now in terms of getting money into to people's pockets. But I also have to consider within the, the constraints we operate within the affordability of these things as well. Because I, I don't do anybody any favours if I stand here and make promises just because it is easier uh, to do when I'm asked a direct question. But we consider all of these things very carefully. We are already the only part of the UK, and this is pre-COVID of course, uh, introducing a, a child supplement to try to accelerate uh, the progress uh, in tackling child poverty. So we uh, understand the impact this crisis will have on child poverty and want to do everything we can to deal with that. But we've got to consider uh, you know, these kinds of proposals very carefully and rigorously. There are, and I, I don't mean this uh, in any critical way, actually it's, it's very helpful and I, I encourage it, but there's lots of good ideas and suggestions coming from a whole range of organisations and think tanks and organisations uh, representing a number of different interests right now and we've got to think through all of these get the right order of priority and and understand the the deliverability of all of that and that will be work that i'm sure we're engaged in for for quite some time on ovo uh, obviously we're aware of the situation there it, it is a, a serious situation with a, a big impact and you've mentioned the potential impact in selkirk which is is obviously a big worry to communities there we will uh, generally as as government uh, seek to engage with all companies who are 
uh, experiencing difficulty. We will do that through our enterprise agencies. We will uh, bring our PACE initiative, which helps uh, with redundancy situations, to bear. And we will look at all suggestions for how we can offer help. In the short term, we will encourage employers uh, to make use of existing schemes to avoid redundancies and encourage the UK government to keep these schemes in place for as long as possible. There are going to be uh, unfortunately, a number of companies that are facing difficult situations like this, and we will have to try and work through these uh, as quickly as possible. Obviously, overall, the quicker, although this, I keep saying, has to be done safely, but the quicker we get the economy moving again, uh, then hopefully uh, the fewer companies we will see uh, falling into this kind of situation. But these will be you know, ongoing discussions across the whole spectrum of the economy, I'm sure, for quite some time to come yet. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. The Scottish Government's COVID advisory group has expressed concern about reports of children presenting with COVID-19 antibodies and symptoms similar to Kawasaki disease. Um, are you aware of any such case in Scotland? And if so, how many? And, and what would the advice be to parents at this stage? OK, this is an issue of concern that we are... Uh, monitoring very carefully and looking at the international experience and evidence around, but it is obviously uh, first and foremost a clinical issue, so I'm going to ask the yeah. CMO to address it. So yeah. since this issue first came to light, um, probably about three weeks ago, with reports from um, some of the London cases, um, it's something we've been watching very closely. And um, at this point in time, I'm not aware of any active cases in Scotland uh, just now, but it's something that clearly um, we're, we're kind of um, keeping an eye out for. Um, I think since those first cases came to light, we've, we've kind of been liaising with uh, colleagues across Europe and, and um, in North America, and we're seeing similar patterns of presentation in those countries as well. But I have to emphasise this is a very rare complication. It's a complication that we get with some other viruses as well, so it's not unique to COVID-19. And essentially what's happening is the, the, the body mounts almost too great a, a kind of inflammatory response to try to cope with the virus. As I say, it's an incredibly rare complication and the fact that it's being recognised gives us an opportunity to be able to try to intervene um, and, and be very vigilant for it just now. My message very much to, to, to parents is, is that um, by and large, the, by far the majority of children who experience symptoms of COVID-19 um, tend to, to kind of follow a, a, a fairly um, a quiet course of, of, of disease in that they have relatively minimal symptoms. But of course, any parent will know just to be watchful for any changes in their children's condition, just to make sure that if they are concerned about anything in particular, is, is that they're seeking some advice on that. This is one of many, many reasons why we need to continue to take quite a cautious approach to what we do here. I mean, there's been lots of commentary throughout uh, the course of uh, this epidemic and, and much of this is, is still uh, areas where we are learning more about this virus. But there's been a lot of commentary about, you know, it potentially not impacting children as much as it does older people. And, and as I say, I'm not sure any of that is absolutely fixed yet in terms of the understanding of the virus. But things like this, although... Uh, again, there may not be full understanding of and may be uh, very small in numbers of cases. It's just one other reason why we have to be cautious because we don't yet fully understand the impact that this virus has um, on children or indeed on the wider population. Jack Foster from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, this morning we broadcast some pretty shocking claims told to us by a number of whistleblowers in Scottish care homes, including one by a staff member at an HC1 residential home in the west of Scotland, who told us she'd seen elderly residents with COVID-19 being allowed to mingle with healthy people in the home. These claims came alongside familiar complaints over general lack of PPE equipment for staff as the outbreak took hold, and a perception that these attempts to raise concerns with management have simply not been taken seriously. Obviously, we're aware that the government is debating measures this week to make it easier to step in and take control of private care homes where there are serious issues. But how concerned are you about these claims in particular? And do you have confidence in the mechanisms currently in place at government level to ensure these sorts of practices are rooted out, given what are potentially very serious implications where that's not happened? Well, I've, I've heard some of uh, the claims that you have been reporting and uh, they are a matter and, and a cause of very significant concern to me, to the Health Secretary, to, to the government. Um, I, uh, from the outset of this uh, epidemic, have seen uh, the, the task of doing everything we can 
to protect care home residents as a collaborative partnership effort between government, uh, local health protection teams, care home providers, uh, with the care inspector performing its task as well. And I continue to see it like that. The government has been working uh, with care home providers to make sure that they have adequate supplies of PPE, for example, uh, it, over and above the normal supplies they would get through their usual supply route. So this is this is a partnership. This is not about one you know, part of the, the system looking to point the finger at another. Um, but care home providers have a principal responsibility to make sure that in their homes, the guidance that they are meant to be following, uh, the rules that they are being meant, meant to be following, the fundamentals of infection prevention and control uh, are followed. Um, and I have huge concern if I hear any suggestion that that is not the case. Um, of course, the care inspectorate has a duty to uh, monitor care homes and to inspect care homes. The care inspectorate is uh, over this period doing unannounced inspections of care homes and it's right that that continues because that is a, a key part of the assurance process. So we will continue uh, right throughout this uh, to make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can uh, to ensure that the standards and quality of care in care homes are as people would expect them to be. And where failings are identified, we will take the appropriate action uh, without going into the detail of it. We've seen that in Sky and the uh, legislative uh, action we're taking this week, subject to the approval of Parliament, of course, will strengthen the ability uh, to step in where there is a, a fear that a care home provider is not meeting the required standards. Uh, Neil Purin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. On the Nike conference, we've spoken to Professor Hugh Pennington of Aberdeen University. Um, he says that any reports into the conference that was produced by the team looking into the outbreak uh, should be released as this might have uh, interesting information, useful information on how the disease uh, was spread exactly. And on patient confidentiality, he points out that other countries have been uh, releasing significantly more information about uh, large clusters of the disease. In New Zealand, for example, uh, they have details on uh, outbreaks at specific weddings or private events like that. So is that something you would consider doing, releasing the uh, full report that was produced by the incident management team, of course, with uh, names uh, redacted of the patients involved and uh, looking at releasing more information on clusters of COVID-19? Uh, both of these issues are uh, legitimate issues. On the publication of the report, that's for the incident management team, I suspect that will be published um, in, in due course. Uh, what I would say here is the, the nature of that event it was a multinational event where actually of the 70 or so people there, a small minority were Scottish. So a number of different countries will have been involved in the contact tracing, which simply makes the, the, the incident management a, a bigger and perhaps more complex issue. But we'll certainly um, give further information on the, the conclusion and the publication of, of that report. Um, on the issue of... Uh, identifying clusters or outbreaks. I, I said earlier on in response to an earlier question that yes, that is exactly what we are considering in terms of the development of test, trace and isolate. And we are looking at what some other countries are doing in the context of that policy. These considerations, um, you know, as I said earlier on, I, I appreciate that people will question the, the different priority that's given to these considerations, but they are all very legitimate considerations. And they will perhaps be different at different stages of uh, an epidemic like this. I, I would again make the point that at the, the time of the Nike conference or the few days uh, afterwards when cases were being confirmed, there was a very small number of cases overall confirmed in Scotland and a very small number of Scottish people that had been at this conference. The risks of patient identification were very significant. And again, I'm not being critical here. We know that in the early stages of anything like this, there will be a, a media interest in identifying people who have cases. Um, so patient confidentiality at that kind of stage may well be a bigger consideration than it would be at a later stage when you've got many, many cases and these risks are not as great. Um, so these are exactly the kind of things that with Health Protection Scotland we are looking at right now to get that balance between confidentiality and public interest uh, into to the right place and, and so that these judgments are made uh, with the right considerations in mind and that will be a key part of the development of the TTI policy. Uh, Severin Carell from The Guardian. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, you say that there are legitimate questions about the new evidence material that's come to light about the Nike conference, but that new evidence shows that there's prima facie evidence that people in close contact with these COVID-19 cases were not traced. And there are now serious questions about a lack of transparency. So there's two questions. Has anyone independently reviewed the handling of this case from the start internally? And if not, why not ex instruct someone externally to carry out a review to restore public confidence in your handling of this? Um, on the, what I said about legitimate questions, can I just be clear what I meant? Because I, I, I never like to allow words to be put into my mouth at these things when I'm able to speak for myself. What I said was it is legitimate. I'm, I'm trying to explain as openly as I can the patient confidentiality consideration that was uh, so crucial at the, the time that those cases were being confirmed. What I'm saying is it is legitimate for people to say, should that have been the overriding consideration? I've explained why it was such an important consideration. I just recognise that people may take a different view of, of that. I uh, have not said, and I'm not saying that I think there are legitimate criticisms or questions about how the public health management of that uh, was was done, uh, and uh, or, or that there was any there are questions about how the incident management team uh, do these things. Uh, I will, of course, consider any anything that we can do to give public assurance around these things. But the incident management team does operate independently. It's not a, a politically overseen uh, process. These are public public health experts that make the decisions based on their public health expertise of who should be contacted and what steps should be taken. And, you know, I, I was not saying that I think there are uh, questions over that. I was saying I think people can look at this situation and come to different views about uh, the factors that were taken into account. Uh, Michael Blackley from The Mail. Hi, good afternoon. You've referred a, a few times today to the desire to get the economy moving again. Um, obviously, the unemployment figures that you refer to show 16,000 additional workers becoming unemployed in the, the first quarter, which is the, the highest increase of any part of the, the UK. Um, how Yesterday, when you were talking about the first potential steps, you only referred to uh, some outdoor work resuming. Um, that, that sounds like what you're proposing might fall short of Boris Johnson's uh, message that everybody that can't work from home should return to work. Do you have any concerns about the, the impact the, on jobs of, of what you're about to announce? Um, could, could we really be facing a, a bit of a jobs catastrophe in this quarter? Um, I think it would be... Uh absurd if I stood here and said uh, I didn't have concerns about the economic or jobs impact of this crisis. I don't think there is a, a leader of any government anywhere in the world that doesn't have profound concerns about that. Uh, but equally, it is also really important that as we bring our economies uh, into operation again, that we do that in a way that doesn't jeopardise the progress in the fight against the virus. Because if we do that, then we'll all be back in lockdown again and the economy will shut down again. And that will have an even bigger and more long lasting impact on the economy. So this is about getting the right balance. Uh, we have to be careful and cautious, uh, but we want to get economic activity uh, started again as quickly and to the greatest extent possible. Um, and these decisions you know, are not about matching other peoples or falling short of other peoples. They're doing what we judge right in the circumstances we face uh, with the level of infection and the the stage we are at in the spread of this virus here in Scotland. The, that is the only consideration here. I have to uh, make with my cabinet colleagues the judgments that we think are right to meet these differing uh, priorities, getting not just the economy, but society moving again, but not jeopardising uh, the progress against the virus, because that is in nobody's interest. These are not easy judgments, but we will continue to make them carefully and uh, with the, the very best expert advice underpinning them. Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, the operators of the Kirkburn Court Care Home in Peterhead are still declining to give specific death numbers at their care home. There are also suggestions that the death toll might be higher than reported in another northeast care home. Um, should operators be taking more responsibility providing accurate numbers? And is this something that, that, that 
you can do to ensure this? And is it something you're, you're prepared to look into? I'm, I'm always prepared to look into uh, any issues that are raised. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much about specific cases because there will be ongoing um, processes underway between uh, that care home or any care home with an outbreak and the uh, local health protection teams and in uh, cases where it's appropriate involvement with the care inspectorate. Uh, but it is really important that we do have uh, transparency around numbers of deaths in care homes or in any other settings. And as I alluded uh, to earlier on, uh, we will have tomorrow the latest uh, National Records of Scotland report, which uh, I... Uh, should make clear, doesn't break down by care home, uh, but gives the overall number of, of deaths for the most recent week uh, that will have uh, taken place in care homes. But we will continue, as I said in response to an earlier question, to try to, uh, as we've done all along, and the data we, were, we are providing now is much more developed than the data we were providing on a whole range of things at the outset of, of this outbreak, and we will continue to try to provide as much data and as much information as possible. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Minister, um, on the issue of uh, moving to routine testing of care home staff, um, Jean Freeman said yesterday that the evidence that I have relied on in order to make that decision is that the route for the virus into a care home is primarily through those who work in the care home. Now, this seems to many to be stating the obvious. Um, is, is, is the main reason or a reason for the delay not that you haven't had the testing capacity until recently to do this. And just separately following up from Kieran Jenkinson's question, um, is it the case then that you do not regret allowing potentially infected and infected patients from hospitals to move into care? I, um, just to clear that up. Again, look, I'm, I'm going to be not, not careful with my words here, but I want them to be my words because I've seen you know some headlines in recent days that, you know, in some respects, are I've seen headlines saying that we were blaming care home staff, um, and, and so I want to be. I regret every single person who's died over this. I every single day feel that burden very heavily. I will probably, for the rest of my life, not just for the rest of my time as first minister, look back on this and and ask myself, did we do everything that we could have done? Are there things we could have done differently? And I, I suspect everybody who's in the kind of position I'm in will find themselves doing that. These are, uh, these are horrendously difficult judgments and we are making them as best we can. I, I don't think it's the case that we will not have made mistakes, but we have to balance learning from those mistakes. In the fullness of time, there will be a, a proper systematic look back in all of this, and, and rightly so. But right now, we have to balance looking back and trying to learn as we go with continuing to focus on the decisions that lie ahead of us. And I will uh, continue to try to do that. But trying to say, do you regret or do you not regret? I, I regret having to stand here every day. I regret this pandemic. I regret every single death and, and will always look critically, uh, self-critically, as well as... Uh, you know, absolutely accept the scrutiny coming from journalists and others about what we've done and what we, we have not done. In terms of the, the, the expansion of testing uh, to uh, asymptomatic staff in care homes where there is no outbreak uh, at this stage, uh, the Health Secretary set out the, the, the clinical uh, reasons for that decision. Yesterday she is uh, about to say more in Parliament um, about that right now. We've made no bones about the fact that throughout this, we have been building up testing capacity. We have been very clear about that. We've been clear about the milestones and the targets we are setting, and we are still building up testing capacity as we move towards test, trace and isolate. But on testing, particularly with old, uh, frail people, it is also really important that there is a, a, a clinical consideration behind each and every single one of these steps. And that's what we have uh, sought to do at, at every stage. And my final point, uh, Gregor may want to say um, a word uh, more about this, but my final point is the one Gregor's already made. Testing is really important and, and I'm not trying to minimise its importance, but I have throughout this always have had another fear, which is that we see testing it's almost like a cure for this virus. And, and we think because we've tested somebody one day, we don't have to worry about the risks and their exposure to the virus after that. And that's why, however much we talk about testing, talking, particularly in the care home setting, about infection prevention and control has to be the most important thing that we continue to focus on. So it's really, really important that we're not indiscriminate 
in terms of the approach that we take to testing and that where we're subjecting people to tests, that there's good reason and good evidence that supports that testing procedure. And now we're beginning to gain evidence that actually asymptomatic spread might be a real thing with this virus. For, for, for a long, long time with this virus, we just didn't know what the role of asymptomatic carriers might be and whether they were capable of making um, the ability to be able to, to kind of spread uh, the disease or not. But, but I think more recent studies start to suggest that, that, that actually that's a possibility. And therefore, applying that precautionary principle in this case, that's why we've made the decision to make sure that we go forward and try to identify any possible human vectors of, um, of this disease in that particularly that vulnerable um, institutions that we can identify as early as possible and, and, and remove them from the ability to be able to, to kind of spread. So, as I say, I think it's, it's about our understanding of this virus and how it has increased quite substantially over time, but we continue to learn about it. And there may be further changes that are introduced in the future again, based on that new understanding of how this virus responds within communities as well. And we need to keep alive to the science. Uh, thanks, Gregor. Um, look, entirely down to me because I've been taking quite a long time to answer these questions because they are all really important questions and I think it's important to answer them fully but we are uh, almost at our hour and we still have a large number of questions we're going to take them all but I will try and speed up a little bit from now so can I go to Alistair Grant from the Herald uh, Hi there thanks very much uh, it's been reported today that teachers are set to return in June uh, to prepare for a new system of blended learning while schools will go back on August 11th under plans drawn up by the Education Recovery Group. Can you confirm that these are the proposals that are currently on the table? Uh, look, these are the kind of things that are being discussed through the Education Recovery Group. We will set it, as I said yesterday, when I published the route map on Thursday, we will give our up-to-date uh, view of the, the phasing of a return to school. But in broad terms, you know what, what you've alluded to there is, is the kind of thing that is being uh, discussed, but we haven't uh, made an, a final decision on that. In summary, we want to see children back in school as quickly as possible. The, uh, many uh, of the impacts of dealing with this virus worry me profoundly, but the, the loss of education uh, or the, the impact on children's education is something that I know worries parents and worries me, worries all of us. So we want to get children back to school as quickly as possible, but we have to do that in a way that is safe uh, and that has the confidence both of parents and of teachers. And that's why we're considering these things so carefully through that education recovery group. But we'll set out uh, the up-to-date position when we publish the document on Thursday. Uh, Tom Martin, the Daily Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, just returning to the briefly to the um, Nike incident. Um, this is now the fourth company to come forward to raise concerns about contact tracing. And it, I understand what both you and the CMO have said about the responsibilities and judgments made by an incident management team. But isn't the part of the problem here that these people could have potentially been infected, not shown any symptoms, and there could have been or potentially was further onward transmission into the community? And also, given the importance that's being attached to TTI going forward, how can the public have confidence in the systems in place? I think the public should have confidence in the systems in place. I, I, I'm not going to repeat everything I've said here. I have uh, rightly, uh, and you know, I, I do this day after day, address this in, in detail because I recognise its importance, but I don't want to just simply start repeating myself. Um, but the incident management team, uh, it is its responsibility to do everything it thinks necessary to protect public health. I am not an expert on these matters. That's why we have experts that do that. And, and what I'm saying in, in summary about any incident like this, if that team of experts thinks that more people should have been contacted or different people should have been contacted, then there is nothing stopping them doing that because they judge what is required to, as far as is ever possible, to reduce the, the risks of onward transmission. And I think that is a, a very well established system in Scotland, uh, not just in this uh, virus, but in other infectious diseases that the public should have confidence in. One thing I have, uh, you know, explicitly referred to today is the need to make sure that as we go into TTI, those uh, those different considerations and how in different circumstances we balance the considerations of 
patient confidentiality and public interest are understood because they will be different considerations in that phase of dealing with the virus than they perhaps were at the very outset when numbers were so low. So these are things we will continue to uh, set out very clearly as we develop and uh, articulate for the public the TTI uh, initiative. Uh, Gina Davison from The Scotsman. Hi, thanks, First Minister. Um, tomorrow, the uh, NHS Louisa Jordan will have been open for a month, and I wondered if you could give us an update on how many patients have actually um, been cared for in the hospital, and whether or not you believe the demand is still there, given the numbers that are reducing in intensive care. Um, I think this is one of these questions where this is not directed at you, Gina, but generally hindsight you know, will always be uh, a very valuable thing to have in these things. Uh, we haven't had to use the NHS Louisa Jordan uh, to deal with, uh, to treat patients so far. And do you know what? I am absolutely delighted about that um, because had we had to deal uh, to use the hospital for that, then we would have been dealing with many, many more people being seriously ill and as a result of that, probably more people dying uh, because the capacity of our existing hospitals would have been exceeded. So I am, I am really happy we've not had to use the NHS Louisa Jordan, but I'm still uh, absolutely of the opinion that it was right to prepare it as a contingency because I wouldn't have wanted to be in a position where we didn't have that capacity should uh, we have needed it. Now, we are uh, increasingly, as cases and uh, hospital admissions decline, although, again, as I keep saying, we're still in a fragile position with that, but as hopefully we continue to see that, uh, we our considerations now are about how we resume hospital uh, procedures that were paused uh, in order to deal with this and uh, no decisions have been taken yet but one of the things we're looking at is whether we can use in any way the capacity of the NHS Louisa Jordan uh, to try to deal with that but um, I'm afraid uh, on the the fact that we haven't had to use it to deal with virus patients yet I am I'm very happy about that as I think everybody should be. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the record. Afternoon, First Minister. Um, we're hearing that the Scottish Government are, is looking at possible alternatives to the current shielding policy, which can be very onerous for those to have home. Sorry, Vivian, uh, you're, you're breaking up and I, I can't hear the you. World, there's a more relaxed view. Sorry, Vivian, you, you broke up there. I think I got the gist of what you were asking me, but if I answer a completely different question, you can you can let me know. Um, I think you were asking me about the uh, our considerations about how people in the shielded category would be uh, perhaps, uh, or, or the advice they would be given in future. Um, and yes, we are, of course, thinking about that. As I've said before, it's really important that as we ease lockdown, we don't forget about people in the shielded category. Uh, the current position is that they were advised to shield for three months uh, at the start of this, which would be uh, up until round about the end of June. That, that remains the advice. But after that, of course, we are looking at whether there are, uh, frankly, less restrictive ways in which we can continue to protect people in that category without having them completely isolated in their own homes in the way that they are just now, because that is not sustainable uh, for, for anybody forever. So we're having early discussions about how we can use testing and the test trace isolate to help with that, how we can use uh, better information to people about the risks in their own area, uh, to how we perhaps, uh, you know, shield the shielders uh, and, and give more precautionary advice to people who are in contact with people in the shielded group uh, in order that people in the shielded group can make more informed decisions about uh, the extent to which they shield versus go about their ordinary life. So, you know, these are, again, not easy decisions. Uh, they are equally not final decisions. But I want to uh, make clear again that people in the shielded group are not forgotten about here. Uh, we we uh, categorise people in that way because they are most at risk from this virus, and that is not going to change. But we have to recognise uh, that people can't live behind closed doors uh, forever. So we need to find different ways of trying to give that protection. And it's very much a... Uh, uh, an intense uh, consideration within the government at the moment. Do you want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I, mean, I think it's just to recognise just that, that significant undertaking that people have had to undergo by shielding and um, that that has an impact not only on their, their kind of physical well-being but, but, but also on, the, on their mental well-being as well. Not only them, of course, but, but, but the families, the, the, the shielders too. I think it's right that we consider whether we can start to articulate the risks that are associated with certain conditions any more clearly so people can come to a personal decision as to how they balance those risks. And all that work is underway just now with as much clinical input into that as we can muster. Okay, thanks. Uh, Muir Dickey from the FT. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, you've been pretty clear that you're happy with the public health management of the Nike conference incident, but to um, come back to Severin's question, has there been any internal review of that management and are you ruling out any independent review of it? I'm not ruling anything out. I, I recognise the need for public assurance around all of this. Um, I, I've tried today to explain the fact that because uh, information that this was a Nike event wasn't put into the public domain didn't mean there wasn't a rigorous public health management of it to, to ensure that any risks were properly catered for. But I will, of course, continue to consider if there are further steps we can, we can take. Beyond that, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not simply going to repeat um, information that I've given on a number of occasions about this already today. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, just following up on that, obviously the argument being put is that if you had made it public, these people who are now coming forward from Lloyds and other businesses would have come forward at the time and been contact traced themselves and tested. Um, do you accept that on reflection um, you made a mistake? Um, no, look, I, I accept that there are different judgments you can always come to about these things. And I'm, you know, I suppose what I'm trying to, to to do here is is be open and and accepting of that. There are very few uh, aspects of dealing with this uh, in my experience over the last couple of months that are absolutely black and white and clear cut. And a lot of it is judgment. And I accepted at the outset of this, and I accept now that sometimes we'll get these judgments wrong. That is not me saying I think that was the case in in this case, but I also accept that even in situations where I think that OK, on balance, I still think the judgment was right. Other people will take a different view because that's the nature of judgment. Um, and I, I suppose what I'm trying to say here is, you know, we can have these debates and it's right that we do and we can accept that people will come to different judgments. What I do take exception to here, and I, uh, you know, I say this very, very bluntly, is the kind of politicised accusation that comes from some quarters, not all, that this was some kind of cover-up. And I just pose again the question, what for? Why? What possible motivation? So, you know, I, I don't want to get uh, too reflective here because it's, we're running out of time apart from anything else. But, you know, I hope, certainly I know that dealing with this right now uh, has made me look at certain things differently and, and hopefully um, we'll all get the chance to reflect on that. But sometimes, you know what, you can come to a different judgment about a difficult issue without often, always having to believe the worst about your opponent's motivations. I've been guilty of that in the past. Maybe that's something I'll try to uh, get a bit different in future. Uh, so, yes, people are entitled to think, you know what, you should have made a different judgment there. But if you only accept one thing, accept that we're trying to make all of these judgments in good faith. And that was true there, as it is with everything we're trying to, to do uh, during this. Right, lastly, uh, on... Uh, Nike or anything else, Kieran Andrews from the Times. Thanks, First Minister. Hopefully, last but not least, um, just very quickly, if we could clarify one thing on on Nike. Um, I think you said that there were ten Scots at the conference. The government had previously said there were eight cases in Scotland associated with the event. Does that mean that eight out of ten attendees tested positive, or could these eight cases be? in the community as well. Um, and on a slightly wider policy point, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee today said that um, in terms of the UK government's response to COVID, capacity drove strategy rather than strategy driving capacity, given it was largely a four nations approach to everything substantive up until the end of lockdown. Was that and is that the case for the Scottish government's approach? Um, on your first question, uh, my understanding, and if I'm getting this wrong, I will correct it 
to you as soon as possible that the, the eight of, so there are 10 Scots at the conference of a total of 70 or thereabouts, I think, and eight tested positive. My understanding is that those were eight of the people at the conference, uh, but if I'm wrong in that, I will clarify. Um, on the uh, second question, I have not read the report yet. I will read the report. Um, and so there may be many things in the report I agree with and I think are fair. Probably there'll be things I think are unfair. I think while there will be elements of that criticism that are, are not unfair, I think how you've just described it there, and I know you're quoting from it, is an oversimplification. I don't think it, at any stage it was all one thing or the other. We, we've tried to do the right things with the resources we have. Where we've not had all the resources we we might have wanted to have, we've tried to get those resources and build them up, and at all times try to take the best decisions based on the best scientific and clinical uh, advice. And, you know, as I say, in the fullness of time, there'll be lots of, and, and rightly so, scrutiny of all of that, and no doubt we will all learn lots of lessons. But, you know, while we're still in the midst of this, um, I will continue to try to learn as we go, but I will also continue to keep focused on the decisions that lie ahead, because the decisions that lie ahead uh, in many ways are as important as the decisions that lie behind us. And I think it's really important that people like me don't take our eye off of that ball. Right, that concludes all of our uh, questions today. Uh, my thanks to the journalists, uh, my thanks to Gregor and, and Anna, our BSL interpreter today. My thanks to you. I, uh, I apologise if I took uh, quite a bit of time to answer some of these questions, but I do really believe that you know, people are raising questions here uh, for very good and understandable reasons. And I have a duty, it's why I stand here every day, to subject myself to that scrutiny and to answer these questions as fully as possible. And also to try to share with you some of the, the judgments that uh, have to be applied. And, you know, with judgment, some people will agree, some people will disagree. But these are not easy decisions. Much of what we're dealing with right now is unprecedented. The point Gregor made earlier on, we are learning different things about this virus every single day. Things that, if we had known at the outset, might have changed the judgments we made at the outset, but we didn't know all these things at the outset. So we are uh, trying to get through this as best we can, and that's what we will continue to do each and every step of the way. So my thanks to you, as always, for joining us. Um, tomorrow uh, is slightly different as has become normal now on a Wednesday. I will be in Parliament. Uh, I think we start at 12.20 on a Wednesday answering uh, First Minister's questions from uh, opposition party leaders, but I'll give the usual statistical update uh, then, and I will see you back here with the publication of our route map on Thursday at 12.30. Thank you all very much for now.